So Tina and I felt that we would tag team you today. And um, I'd like to continue on her image of calling. I thought the, the images and the, the metaphor and, and how we uh, try to capture the infinite, it was interesting and, and into the freedom. So we, we thought it would be interesting. We hope it's not confusing to have two perspectives. So uh, I wanna talk about these days, our uh, culture seeming to be caught up in the idea of personal rights, uh, the right to make as much profit as we might want, the right to strip mine or frack just because it's there. And of course the right to bear arms um, as distorted as that right may have become. Uh, I want to avoid that third rail. It's, it's uh, rather political, but I, I just take it as a, a sense of, of what we might be doing if we take things to an extreme. Um, I merely, I, you know, how would you feel you know, with the Supreme Court's recent ruling that people can carry guns? wherever they want. How would you feel if you were in the playground with your child or grandchild and someone was packing? Um, and, and again, I, I don't want to get into this emotionally charged thing, but I include it as an example of our obsession, what I would say, our obsession with rights. And I say obsession, not because individual rights are a bad thing. Clearly, we see examples around the world of horrible injustices where individuals do not have basic human rights. Um, and, and we know the problems that occur with that. Rather, it's the one-sided practice and the one-sided one -side dimension of the practice of rights. Rights without limitation often lead to excesses and injustices themselves. Uh, ironic the very thing that was intended as good, when practiced without limitation can lead to injustice. Think of the freedom of speech and what happens when it's practiced to spew hatred, division against another, be it an ethnic group, religion, someone's sexual orientation, political perspective. What I am getting at then is that rights come with responsibilities. There's a Native American expression, likely in response to our Western tendency to carry personal rights to extreme. It goes something like this. Do not speak to me of your rights, but rather of your responsibilities. Mimi and I had the opportunity last summer to travel to New Mexico, a first for us, and besides a beautiful countryside, we were so impressed with the Native American culture and spirituality, which is built on responsibility to family, to the broader community, and of course to nature. A, a powerful concept responsibility when you think of it. I think that was what Jesus was speaking about in today's second reading, at least to me from Galatians. I'll repeat the words that Tina spoke, you were not called for slavery, but freedom. So don't submit to the yoke of slavery. Encouraging words and certainly consistent with our ideas of Catholic social justice. And yet Jesus carries it farther as he tends to do to disturb our complacency. Do not use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Rather serve one another through love. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Beautiful words, but I struggle with them a little bit. Um, and if I can be so impertinent as to suggest that Jesus' words still suggest a bit of selfishness. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Pretty egocentric, 
And given what we know about how, how and when scriptures were written by people long after Jesus' life, I, I have my own doubts that Jesus actually said it in such an egocentric way. Rather, I prefer the other exhortation he made, love one another as I have loved you. Powerful stuff. As we know, Jesus loved without limit, and it was other directed. Who could miss the message of unconditional, and I've even heard it referred to as irrational love. I have this image of judgment day, and again, not a literal one, I don't subscribe to that theologically, but as a concept, and as the masses of humanity are gathered, Jesus looks at the various religions with their conflicting dogmas and injustices and hurts carried out in the name of those dogmas. And he makes a simple statement. I left you with one simple request. Love one another as I have loved you. How and why could you make it so complicated and screw it up? So I'd like to leave you with a wonderful story that a Jesuit friend shared during the homily at my 50th high school reunion not too long ago. I may have shared this in a smaller setting. Once I heard about a teacher from a rural town in upstate New York who gathered her young students and posed a question to them that she thought was straightforward but challenging. How do you know when the night is gone and the day has come? One youngster shot up her hand. When you can look over the ridge and tell the difference between an apple tree and a cherry tree. No, said the teacher. Another boy suggested, when you can look into the nearby field and you can tell the difference between two figures, you realize then that one is a dog and one is a calf. No, the teacher said again. Then you tell us, said the students. The teacher looked in their eyes and said, you know that night is gone and day has come when you look into the eyes of a total stranger in need and see the eyes of God calling you to reach out and help. Until that moment arrives, you're always living in darkness. It is always night. So, let us heed the words of Jesus to love as he loved. And in so doing, we can emerge from the darkness of night into the light of day.